Hi everyone, this video is the sixth part of my AP Psychology series called Unit Zero Science Practices. This particular video will cover correlational research and data interpretation. By now you've already learned the differences between experimental and non-experimental research methods. So in this video, I'll do a more in-depth explanation of the non-experimental method called correlational research. To begin, here's a look at the key focuses of this particular video. By the end, you should be able to answer the following questions. These are the essential concepts that will be covered in this video. They relate to correlational research and data interpretation related to correlational studies. So first, what is correlational research? Correlational studies focus on relationships between variables. They determine if factors are related to one another without manipulating or interfering with them. It's used to identify patterns, trends, potential links between different psychological factors, um, such as the relationship between stress and health outcomes. It's a really useful method because it allows researchers to explore connections in natural settings, um, collecting that data easier than they might be able to in an experimental study, especially if that, that could not be studied ethically or practically in a laboratory setting. However, correlational research does have limitations, and most notably, one of those limitations is that you cannot determine cause and effect. So this could leave open the possibility that observed relationships could be due to third variables or bi-directional influences. And this is a really important factor to remember with correlational studies, that because they are not experimental, you cannot determine if one factor is causing another. So before I move on, let me make two points really clear. One, correlational research is a non-experimental method, therefore you cannot prove cause and effect. And two, correlational research can show us whether variables are related, either positively or negatively and to what degree, and how well factors might predict one another. We need evidence to help us determine if correlations exist between variables, and we know already that humans have the tendency to be overconfident in our assumptions, to perceive patterns in random events, and to fall for the confirmation bias. And so we know that we are vulnerable to biases. And so another just one to add on top of that is the illusory correlation. And that's when we have a perception of a relationship between two variables when one doesn't exist. And a great example of this is the belief that there's a connection between full moons and erratic behavior. And despite widespread popular belief, there's numerous scientific studies that have found no consistent evidence to support this claim. Now, you could test this claim. You would take two variables, uh, nights with full moons and behavior incidents. Um, you could do discipline incidents at school, and you would track those numbers and see if they increase together or decrease together, or if one increases while the other decreases. But unfortunately, this particular example is a perceived relationship and not supported by correlational studies. And the reason why this persists is because of cognitive biases like the confirmation bias. And these cognitive biases can create the illusion that there's a correlation when there is none. And it can lead people to believe in false associations like full moons and unusual behavior. So this is just another reminder to us that our beliefs may not necessarily be in line with evidence support supported um, conclusions. And so we could, though, easily put these to, test, to the test with collecting research. So another factor to really keep in mind whenever you are evaluating research done on correlations is that correlation cannot determine causation. And one of the reasons it cannot determine causation is because with correlational studies, you can have a directionality problem, which occurs when it's not clear which variable is the cause and which variable is the effect. So in other words, if you have two variables, variable A and variable B, you may know that they're correlated based on the the evidence you've collected, but you may not be sure if A causes B or if B causes A. And there could also be a potential of bi-directional influence that A is causing B and B is causing A, and they are influencing one another. So this is a very important consideration when looking at research collected in correlational studies. Another factor to be aware of when you're evaluating research done in correlational studies is the third variable problem. This is another reason why you cannot determine that 
correlations equal causation. And so the third variable problem occurs when an unmeasured variable, we're going to call this variable C, is actually influencing variables A and B and creating a false impression that a and b are directly related to one another for example suppose a study finds a correlation between ice cream sales and drowning incidents the third variable problem might actually reveal that the real reason that ice cream sales are increasing at the same rate as drowning incidents would be that there's a third variable and not that ice cream sales and drowning incidents are directly related. And the third variable here, variable C would be hot weather. As hot weather increases, so does ice cream sales and so does the number of people swimming, which in turn can increase the risk of drowning. And this is the third variable problem, which reminds us we cannot determine in causation from correlational studies. So correlational studies, they're not experimental. We're not manipulating them. We're just collecting data about two variables. And so here we have one of those situations where a researcher collected two variables related to college students. They collected the number of study hours per week each college student conducted and then their happiness score. So we can see that data collected in a table, but that's also hard to determine if they're related by just looking at those numbers. So we are going to plot them on a scatter plot. So you can see that to the right. You can see across the x axis we have study hours per week. That's our first variable. And then across the Y axis, we have happiness score. And so what we will do is we will plot a dot that represents the connection between study hours and happiness score for each of the students. So for example, for student one, student one studied 10 hours per week. So across the X axis, we would go to 10 and that same student had a happiness score of 70. So we would go up the Y axis to 70 and then we would find the intersection between those two variables and place a dot. So this is what all 15 students data looks like plotted on a scatter plot. You can see that it creates a trend, a pattern. It appears that the dots are descending as a whole from left to right. And if you remember, each single dot is representing an intersection between the two variables, but the dots as a whole are showing us whether or not there's a relationship and what direction that relationship is going. So what we can see here is that there is a pattern. There's a flow. It's moving down from left to right. We would call this a negative relationship. And what it's representing is that when one variable is high, the other is low or when one variable increases, the other decreases. And we can see that if we were to just look at a single dot. So let's look at our dot that is closest to the left-hand side. You can see that this single dot that is falling on our x-axis, this student studied six hours per week. You could see they studied a very low amount in comparison to the other students, but they had a high, a very high happiness rating in between a score of 85 and 90, one of the highest scores. And then we can see something similar if we're looking at the other end, that as one variable is high, this particular student has a high happiness score, but their study hours per week was low. So let's look at a student farther across on our x-axis. Let's look at our dot that's farthest to the right. Our dot that's farthest to the right on our scatter plot here, this particular student studied 20 hours per week, but had a lower happiness score of 60. And so what we can see for that particular student that the higher or the increase of study hours was connected or related to a lower happiness score. And so we call this a negative relationship that when one variable is high, the other is low. So this brings us to interpreting the relationship of variables by looking at scatter plots, determining whether there's a relationship or not and what the strength and direction is of the relationship between the variables. And as I mentioned, on our x-axis is one variable and on our y-axis is the other variable. The dots are representing the intersection between each of those variables. But then when we look at them as a whole, what the dots are doing can indicate whether or not there is a relationship between those variables. And what we see here is we see a similar pattern that the dots as a whole are representing a fall from left to right. And what we saw in our 
our previous example is that when one variable is high and the other is low or vice versa, this means that there is a negative correlation. There is a relationship. It's a negative one. As one variable rises, the other falls or as one variable increases, the other decreases. In this particular example, you can see that the dots are forming a line that looks like it's descending from left to right in almost like a, a perfect fashion in a constant rate. And this is what we call a perfect negative correlation. This is also a negative correlation. Visually, you see the dots are making a downward fall from left to right. They're not perfectly in sync, so we would call this a strong negative correlation between the two variables. Here you can see there is still slightly a descent of dots from left to right. It's a becoming a little less distinct, but we can still see that flow and that pattern from left to right downward. So this is depicting a weak negative correlation. Now remember, negative correlations are relationships. It just means as one variable increases, the other decreases, or as one falls, the other rises, or one variable is low while the other is high. An example of a negative correlation would be the more meals you cook at home, the fewer times you eat out in a month. So negative correlations are absolutely relationships between two variables, but as one increases, the other decreases. When you look at this scatter plot, you can see that the dots here are dispersed across the graph in no particular pattern or slope. And if you plot your two variables and the data you've collected and appear something like this, this represents no relationship between the two variables. So if you were to collect data on people's preferred outdoor temperature and the number of movies they've watched in their lifetime, it would likely look something like this, no relationship. So now you can see on this scatter plot, the data is appearing to show the dots ascending upward from left to right. This is representing a weak positive correlation. You can see the dots are, are showing this pattern, but it's not perfectly in sync. A positive correlation is when looking at the X and Y axis, the variables tend to be low together or high together, or as one variable increases, so does the other. On this scatter plot, you can see a strong correlation. What we were looking at in the previous example was a weak correlation, but you see it's stronger because the dots are becoming more in line from left to right. As you can see on this scatter plot, we have a perfect positive correlation, and that represents as one variable increases on the y-axis, the other increases at the same rate on the y-axis, and it's creating this straight line of dots. Now remember, our dots are representing the intersection between the two variables, but the dots as a whole, if we're looking at them as a whole, the pattern can show us whether or not there is a relationship and to what degree and in what direction. And so as we're looking at a positive relationship here, I want you to remember positive relationships represent as one variable is low, the other is low. As one is high, the other is high. Or as one variable increases, the other increases. An example of a positive correlation would be as the number of hours you work increases, so does your salary or your income or your wages. That would be a positive correlation. As one increases, the other increases. A correlation coefficient is a number value that tells you how strong a relationship is between two variables and what direction it is. There's a formula that statisticians can use to calculate the correlation coefficient using all the data they've collected. As AP Psychology students, you do not need to calculate a correlation coefficient, but you do need to know by looking at that number value what it means. You can see the formula here on the right hand side of your screen. You can see the product from this formula equals R, and a correlation coefficient is telling you the relationship between two variables. So let's talk about what to do with that number value and how to determine what it means. So you can see on this continuum that we have correlation coefficients from negative one to positive one. If the correlation coefficient is close to positive one, it means the variables have a strong positive correlation. If it is exactly positive one, it means there's a perfect positive correlation. Now, if you look at the other side, negative one is also a relationship. Negative one represents a perfect 
negative relationship or correlation between the two variables. And a zero correlation coefficient means there's no relationship. So one tip to keep in mind, sometimes students just get confused and they see negative one. And for some reason they think that means there's no relationship and that is not true. The ones, whether negative one or positive one are representing relationships. The negative and positive sign just help you understand the direction of that relationship. And zero represents no relationship. This diagram nicely arranges both of those together visually what a relationship looks like on a scatter plot when we're plotting our two variables as well as the corresponding correlation coefficient you can see the number value at the bottom with the visual representation on the scatter plot so to close out our video let's do some quick review questions remember i'll read the question to you make sure to pause the video to determine the answer and then i will show you the correct answers at the end number one says which of the following correlation coefficients represents the strongest relationship number two says there is a negative correlation between tv watching and grades what can we conclude from this research finding Number three says researchers have discovered that individuals with lower income levels report having fewer hours of total sleep. Therefore, question number four says, which of the following is an example of a negative correlation? So this concludes part six, correlational research design and data interpretation. Be sure to check your answers at the bottom of the screen. And then can you go through and check, are you able to do the following tasks on the right hand side? And can you define those essential concepts from this video?